Happy Monday, everybody. It's time for another edition of Ask Mike. Courtney Mims alongside Mike Irwin here. Mike, I'm going to jump right into the questions because we have a very full Monday and a lot of questions to get to. Our first one is from H.L. McCama. She wants to know, am I just making excuses or does it seem like almost every team in the SEC plays its best game against our basketball hogs? I've watched LSU some on TV this year. I never saw them hit shots like they did on Saturday. Uh, probably most people watching this because they're angry would, would not agree with you. They would say you are making excuses. Uh, but I know what, I understand what he's basically saying. I watched LSU a lot. I watched, I watched every SEC game that was on TV Saturday. I watched all of these teams because I want to see how good they are. And LSU had lost three in a row. They were mad. They had a whole week to get ready for Arkansas. Can you imagine what it's like to have a week to get ready for this team? Because you can see what's wrong with it. So they were ready. But you could be shooting against air and not shoot as well as they shot at the start of that game. <laughs> I mean, their, their big man, who I think Muss wanted but didn't get, their big man averages 11 points a game. He scored 25, and he hit four of his first five threes. He normally doesn't even shoot five threes, you know, in a game. And he hits four or five. They hit three or four other threes. They shot like 62% in the first half and 59% from three. So when you do that, you hit somebody in the mouth. And when you're as fragile as this team is, which they had been playing better, but you sort of need the other team to at least be a little bit normal in order for you to not get knocked back. And so what happens when, when you run into a buzzsaw like that, it just kind of makes everything go back to the way it was. But, that, but you made uh, a point to say that on the show a couple of weeks ago, I think it was, that that's the way you beat Arkansas. You come out you and you hit them in the mouth. You do, but that doesn't necessarily mean you can hit shots, 62% <laughs> of your true. shots in the first half and 58% from three. That just knocks in you. Look, I don't like the three-point shot. I know I come across as old geezer on this. And it's been around forever. I don't like it because it's too easy. If you've got people that can hit threes, and let's face it, you know why it's so hard to, to win on the road in college basketball? That's part of it. Because teams shoot, players shoot better at home than they do on the road. So you go on the road and you face this team and boom, 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 boom. They just bury you with three-point shots. And it sort of takes away all the other elements of the game. But they're not going to do away with I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. But I am saying that, yes, they could do a better job of defending from the line. But again, they were trying to play good defense. And, and when you're doing that and people switch off and somebody penetrates into the lane and bam, kicks it back out real quick. Arkansas is not the only team that doesn't get somebody back out there right in somebody's face. And, and the point is that even if you shoot open threes, you don't hit them like that usually. And Arkansas has played a lot of teams this year that have just went, it looks like it was automatic. Well, and that's partly because, and, and Musselman has said this multiple times, they are not good at defending the three. They are not a good well, again, team at defending the three this year. I understand that, but even if you don't defend the three, <laughs> if you stand there glued in the paint. Yeah, you shouldn't make they, that many, right? The, the, a lot of teams aren't going to hit that many. Yeah. And that is really one of the problems with this team. They don't have a three-point shooter. They hit three in this game. The other team hit 12. And when you can't shoot threes, what do you not do? You don't spread their defense out. They can compact because they don't have to worry about you on the three-point line. And then they can make it doubly tough on you trying to penetrate and get points in. Look, Arkansas did some things in this game. They, they outscored LSU in the paint by quite a bit. They uh, second-chance points outscored them quite a bit. Where they got killed was, again, the shooting of LSU and then turnovers. That's the other fatal flaw with this team offensively. Their point guards don't, don't, don't handle the ball well, but nobody really does. They're all throw, always throwing it away. Yeah. And so that led to all these, these uh, points off turnovers that LSU had. So it was just a combination of those things. And now they're really in a bind. I don't, I don't really see where they go from here. Yeah, really in a bind. I think that's uh, maybe putting it a little bit lightly. We have more basketball to talk about. And Giles asks, what's your take on the Mackay must blow up in the LSU game? Not a good look when a player disrespects his coach like that. Yeah, a lot of people are saying that's, that, that was a microcosm or, or, or a, 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 an event that shows what's wrong with this team. I disagree with that. 
and you and I have discussed this and we agree with this, you have to look at what happened after that. Yes. We've seen Musselman, when he gets mad at a player, they vanish. They don't play the rest of the game. They might not play for two games <laughs> yeah, if he's really mad at them. <laughs> what happened to Makai Mitchell? He went right back in the game. I just think Makai is a guy that's been under a lot of pressure, but he's been playing better lately. And it kind of got to him that Musselman was yelling at him. Musselman probably thought, okay, yeah, I better back off of him a little bit because he is playing well, and I don't want to take that away from him right now. So I just think that turned into a big nothing burger. It, it was oh. something for fans to talk about, but I don't think it's an example of the team is falling apart. I think they had other problems than that before this. To stick up for Makai, and this is why I kind of take took Makai's side a little bit, and I think Musselman did it realized at the end too, is because – it, what Musselman was mad at him for was a turnover, but it wasn't his fault. He thought Keon Manyfield was going to be there, and the point guard should have been there in that play. He wasn't. So Makai was like, this was not my fault. This, and you could see the mounting frustration of, yeah. this wasn't my fault. Why are you and getting mad And maybe Must didn't get a good look at it, you know. That's what I think. I think maybe Must didn't get a good look at it, and he realized, oh, wait, I shouldn't be mad at him for this, which is why we saw him back in the game. So, so fans can talk about it, but I don't think that – with all the problems this team has, I don't think that's one of them right now. No, I don't either. Southern Rays asks, are any of you in the media group going to explain what happened with Devo Davis? Do you honestly not know? I read this stuff where he will go back on the radio soon and actually explain what happened. He needs to do this. I'm tired of these crazy rumors. Well, the nature of all this stuff is such that we don't want to talk about it. We, we, we've heard what some of the fans have heard. I frankly believe the number one rumor, and I'm not going to repeat it, but I frankly believe it's not true. It's incorrect. I've been told it's incorrect. Yeah, I've been told it's incorrect as well. <laughs> so maybe what all these people think happened is not what happened. But there, are, there clearly is an issue there. And I agree with, with him. I think the real thing to do here, unless you don't care, if you're Devo and you want this cleared up, yeah, go on the radio and say what happened. I, I don't know that he's coming back. I keep hearing some people say that he, he'll be back. I don't know. It's getting a little late for that. Uh, but I do think that it would help clear this up. But don't get mad at us for not repeating a bunch of crazy rumors because I'm not going to do it. No. I go on Facebook and I read all this stuff and people are going taking this and going to here and going to there. And I think they're wrong, but I'm, it, it really reminds me of how, once again, how crazy social media is. There's not anybody repeating these rumors that knows these guys personally, nope. Devo or anybody else that they, is involved in their little rumor Man. thing. They don't know them. They've heard what somebody else said, but then posted this, and they're yeah, that's what that is. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And they're talking about people's lives. They might be wrong. Does it not bother you to say somebody is doing something or is something or this has happened or that's happened, and, and, and you're entirely wrong about that because you never knew in the beginning what was going on? You just repeated what everybody else said? Well, you can do that. We can't. Yeah, and so, also, I, I've been reading a lot into this, all these rumors going around and think, first of all, that's why Danielle Musselman put out a tweet and was like, you guys are crazy. Some of the things I've been reading, Netflix can make a three-part series out right, of it. So that ridiculous. was pretty telling. That was pretty telling. And the other thing, too, is that I, I, I think I told you this. Somebody on our Ask Mike a couple of weeks ago commented when the Devo stuff came out, oh, Courtney, you need to stop mothering these players. You need to stop being a mother of these players. You know, no, my job isn't to be a mother to these players, but I'm also not going to comment on a player when it's his life, when it's his, when it's his job to tell us what's going on with him. I think this is a situation that we got to let Devo tell his story. And if that's he doesn't, always, then he doesn't. And if he doesn't, then he doesn't. I mean, that's uh, th truly that is my opinion on this, and it, obviously some other people have different ones, but that's my opinion. I know that's yours too. Mouse Town says, Last week when you listed Blocker as one of the players you think is coming back next season, why is everybody so high on him? He can't shoot free throws. He misses layups and short jump shots. He also fouls too much. Here's my take on Blocker. First of all, he's an Arkansas kid, and he loves being a Razorback. You can tell that. And he wants so bad to make a difference in a season in which they need some help. And I think he's overdoing it. I think he's overanxious. I think he's pushing it. I think he's out of control sometimes. 
And I think when he gets to the free throw line, again, that gets to him a little bit. So I think it's a case of it matters too much to him. If he were an out-of-state kid, somebody that came in through the portal, I don't think he would have this problem. So, yeah, you bring him back next year, and I don't think he has these problems, especially if he's surrounded by a better group of players, which I think will happen. So now this brings up the other issue, and it's important to me. You can, I understand Musk going into the portal and making major changes every year. You've got to have one or two players at least that come up through your system, and to me they need to be Arkansas kids. What's wrong right now, I believe, is that you don't have a stabilizing force for the guys that came in here, like Makai when he does that. If you have somebody that's been here for four, they can take that, that player aside and say, look, this is the way he coaches. He's a very demanding guy, and he's not fair, and it's not fun, and you don't like getting chewed out, but guess what? At the end of the year, you, you'll, you'll be glad you did this. This is his style, and you're in this system so let's get, get, let's get on with it. That's what you get when you get a kid that's been here, and especially an Arkansas kid, where it's, he's invested in this. He didn't just come in here from the outside. So I think letting Darian Ford go last year was a mistake. I think he's a good player. And I think Blocker can be a good player. And I think you can't just turn around and take these Arkansas kids and after one year go, ah, you're not what we thought. You know, you were supposed to be a five-star. You're not. Get out of here. I, I, I think, and I don't think Mus will do that. No, but I. But some I of don't the fans so apparently, he's really weird about blockers. Some fans love him and think he should play more, and others are mad at him because he misses free throws. So well, he's also, I, and I go back to this point every time we bring up these young freshmen. They are still freshmen at the end of the day. The moment can be very big for them, and there's a lot of pressure that I think he puts on himself as exactly. a player from the state of Arkansas. Like you said, he makes the moment a little too big, and, and it just takes somebody, like you said, somebody older on that team who understands and goes, hey, it's going to be okay. You're going to be good. Just, I've been just, here. Exactly. Yeah. Buy into the process. Just, you know, stay, I think develop. Darian Ford would have had an impact on this team this I, year because yeah. he was here last year, and he's an Arkansas kid. You yeah. just got to have some of those. You, you absolutely do, Mike. Smithian says, this team has the least chemistry of any team I've ever seen. Musselman threw a lot of random ingredients into the pot the last few years, and as a gourmet chef, he made it work. This year, the ingredients clash. A gourmet chef can't make that work. I like that example. Yeah, I, example. I wouldn't disagree with any of that. In fact, I put that up on Twitter uh, like about a week ago, and people are still mad about it. They're, oh, they're, oh. they're just saying it's an excuse. I don't think it's an excuse. I think it's an explanation. This is the one, that statement was the one that de de generated all these comments about Musselman has to take more response. It, it's on him. He, it's his fault. And I wasn't trying to say that he had no role in this because I understand that he recruited these guys. He brought them in here. But, again, he didn't forget how to coach in one season. It, it's, all you have to do is look at this, and it's pretty logical. It's pretty easy to see what happened. He brought in a bunch of guys that individually looked good, but when you combined them, it didn't work. And it's not working, and, and, and they've made it a little better, but it's too late, and it's not going to work, and they're just going to have to start over again with more ingredients. And, and look, this is the first time this has happened. The three previous teams, he did a great job of bringing them in. Mm -hmm. So it's just, if you're going to, in these days of the portal and major changes and all this, this can happen. Absolutely, and I, you're right. I like how you say, I don't think he forgot how to coach in just one season. Exactly. Can you imagine just that, well, I don't know how to coach anymore. I'm just uh, do, 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 waddling around this season. Uh, I think it is a good explanation for what's happening this year. To football, where Marty Bird's proxy asks, would you agree that it's extremely important for the Hogs to get at least one win out of the first three tough games, OSU, Auburn, a and That should give them three wins by the end of September and make the rest much more manageable and cool Sam's seat down a little. I think if they win the first one, they can win the other two. I think that first one is huge, and I'm not sure they can win it. That's a tough game early in the year. I don't know who made this schedule out. I was talking <laughs> to somebody about this last night. This game should have been canceled. Whoever, whoever lined it up was out of their mind because let's look at this. You got an, an Oklahoma State 
bunch of people over there that are already mad because they've been left out of the SEC. They're over there holding the bag. OU leaves, their main rival leaves, they're just sitting there, and they're mad not only at Arkansas, they're mad at the SEC. So what are they going to be trying to do in this game? They're going to be trying to say, hey, SEC, let's see what you do. That is going to be a tough environment. Their fans are going to be all pumped up. They return the makings of a really good team. Arkansas, we don't know yet. I would seriously doubt that Arkansas can win that game, and if they lose that game, you have to worry about the impact that it has on the other two. But if you want to win early and, and, and you want to end, I don't, I don't think there's such a thing as, hey, we have to win at least one of those. Obviously, you need to do that. Well, I mean, that's so, of course. Yeah. <laughs> of course you need to, to win one of those three. If you lose all three of them, you're in deep trouble. But I would say the first one is the one that really matters because then it can open the door for the other two. Absolutely, and it's so funny you say, I think they should cancel that game. I think they maybe want to cancel that game, but uh, they have a contract. So. Well, you can get out of contracts. Not You I, can't do it now, but they could have done it earlier. Maybe, yeah. I think they're thinking, ooh, that one doesn't look so nice on the schedule now. Hogfan in Texas says, there are two Razorback four-star players left in the portal, a wide receiver and a linebacker. Are they eligible to continue classes, or are they just out of luck since no other team has picked them up? Were they just not that good, or are they looking for NIL money? Okay, the two players are Sam Bakke yeah. and Manny Powell. Now, Manny Powell is a linebacker, and he's still in the portal. And honestly, even though they're not going to listen to me, I think they ought to, and Pittman has a, a history of not inviting players back that hit the portal. It's pretty rare that he says, okay, you can come. He needs to do that here because they are really short of linebackers. So I'd love to see him come back out of the portal and see if they can do something with him next year. Uh, and Bakke, whatever happened, he got into it with Pittman. I know that. There's something that happened there. They said it was over a traffic stop. I can't believe a traffic stop results in something like this. Hmm. But they don't want him back. He was essentially kicked off the team. Yeah, yeah. So he's in the portal because of that. And I don't see him coming out of the portal. Now, in answer to the question, yes, the scholarships are for one year. So you can go, you're, you can continue to go to class, and I assume they both are, this semester, hmm. be, even if you're in the portal, because the scholars, and again, you, you didn't get in the portal and get picked by somebody, so you're not gone to that other school. So yes, you can go to school this semester, and they've still got an opportunity over this summer to go somewhere else. But um, I just don't think Bakke's coming back. Unless yeah, if you get something off, really changes there. If you get kicked off the team, I think that's like a closed door, you know. Okay, we're done. But Manny Powell would be an interesting case if he did get invited back. I think that would be very interesting. I don't to see really that think happens. that will happen either because Pittman doesn't have a history of doing that, but I think they're so short of linebackers. If I'm Travis Williams, I go, Hey coach, we need this guy back. Yeah, and that's if Manny Powell even wants to come back. We right. have no idea what happened in that exit interview meeting, and maybe the, the door is closed that Manny closed it himself. Who knows? Hot Dogger says, now we pay players to come play for us. What's next? Pay them bonuses to win games, stay the full season, play in a bowl game? Don't they already receive a free education and other essentials that are worth money or even more for a future? Now, this is the huge debate that's going on in, among the fans right now. you got you got some fans like this guy, and everybody knows I agree with that line of thinking. Then you got all these other people that say, no, players have, have gotten the shaft for too many years. It's time they got theirs. Everything, they have a right to make money, uh, blah, blah, and they go on and on and on about this. And again, they're not looking at what college athletics was intended to be and what I think it still should be. And it's not a matter of, oh, we need more money or this or that. It's a matter of why do you play the game? If you're sitting out there thinking this, you're not thinking like a player, in my opinion, because players love the game. That's why you do it. I ask myself, and you could take most people that wanted to be college football players but weren't good enough to become one. If you had the talent to get a college scholarship and to go on campus and, and, and be on campus for four years. College is a great time. You, you go on campus and you get to know people and you get into events that go on there and it becomes your home for three or four years. And you're proud of it. And you want to win games because you're there representing that school. And you've, you've got 
your, your education paid for, you're going to get a degree because they don't let players anymore. In the old days, you could go play for somebody for four years and you might only make two years progress toward a degree and then it's up to you when it's over. They don't allow that anymore. The NCAA will declare you ineligible and take you away from football or basketball and make you do nothing but go to class till you get eligible again. So you're going to get a degree. You've got your room and board paid for. With the new co cost of attendance scholarship, you're going to get $900, $1,000 a month spending money, and you get to be on campus, and you're a, you're a football player or a basketball player. You're kind of elevated above the average student, and it's cool. Why wouldn't that be enough? That's what I'm asking. Why is that not enough? Why is it, oh, well, I have a right to make a half million dollars a year. Oh, I'm... Uh, I'm Arch Manning. I have a right to make $2 million and not even play. I mean, this is how insane all this stuff is. So I agree with him, but there are people out there that don't agree with, with me well, and him. I, I have, like, can, I, can I say I half agree? Because I, I do agree with the fact that name, image, and likeness. You as an athlete should be able to make money off of your name, image, and likeness because Joe, the, the, the whole thing that bothered me so much and bothered other people that I know, is that people in, in different states, in different countries, were making money off of athletes' name, image, and likeness that don't even know them, aren't related to them. They would make money. Why is that fair that this random guy, you know, Bob in South Dakota, gets well, to make money? Well, they shouldn't be allowed to do that. Exactly, but they, but they were. And so that's when the, the Supreme Court said, you know what, we need to allow athletes to make money off of that because it's their... That's my name. That's well, my they image. Should have, what the Supreme Court should have said is you have a right to sue these people if they do it. Sure. Okay. Not, they turned that that ruling into some kind of just general, hey, you can make as much money as you want. Well, well, and there was a lot, right, and that's where there should have been stipulations on it, right, where you can maybe make money off of your name, image, and likeness, but what if, Mike, what if it went into a, like a fund, a savings account for you that you got after college? Yeah. There, what about a, that? There's that a lot of things cool. that can be done along the lines of this, and I'm not, I'm not even suggesting that NIL should go away because it won't. It won't yeah. make any difference. It's not going away. The genie's out of the bottle or whatever. All I'm saying is I agree with what he says, which is all those people that think athletes have been getting screwed all these, and it's time they made a lot of money because the coach is doing all that. They are overlooking what I think would be one of the coolest things that could ever happen to you if you're a football player or a basketball player baseball, volleyball, whatever the sport is, to be on a college. I still remember what it feels like to be 18, 19 years old and on a college campus. You're away from home for the first time. You don't have your parents around telling you what to do. You're trying to grow up, and you're kind of walking around. You're learning names of other students and getting to know them. I still remember the first time at North Texas State I ran into a hippie. I thought the guy was insane, and I still do think hippies are insane. But you <laughs> encounter that. And you get to see that, and, and you, you just absorb. Part of it is finding all the cool places to eat around town. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I went there. Okay, let's go over there. Go to the drive-in. Still remember with my buddies where we'd put four in the trunk and two drive-in, and we'd pull up there, and everybody gets out of the trunk, and we, we can all go to the drive-in and only pay for two <laughs> tickets. I mean, you just get to do stuff like that, and it's great. Well, if you're an athlete and you're on a scholarship, and you're getting to play for your school and go out and win games, that's even better. So to me, that's enough. Well, and it's the reason, personally, when people have asked me, why did you want to co go cover the Razorbacks when you could have covered a pro team? And I know you feel the same way as me, Mike, on this. It's because college athletics, it's there's different. nothing. It's different. There's nothing like it. But now, with the addition of NIL and all the, the fact that it's the wild, wild west, it, it's, it's hard to see that, that original concept of that you're playing for the love of the it's, game it's going away it is uh corvette phil asks, what are your thoughts on the the tennessee and virginia attorney generals filing suit against the ncaa over nil i don't see a violation of the sherman act in a normal world i would see the ncaa prevailing since membership is voluntary however we don't seem to be living in a normal world well he makes some good points but nobody knows <laughs> uh, again all these people that are against the ncaa and want this suit to be successful and some of them are Tennessee fans or Florida State fans or, or whoever, the schools that, that the NCAA has finally decided to crack down on, they have a vested interest in this. They want their school to be able to continue to just buy players in the recruiting process. 
So they're saying that what this, this the, the courts are going to eventually rule this is a violation of antitrust, that these players have a right to, to make as much money, and so the schools have a right to offer them that, oh that money. I like the concept that this is voluntary because you, if you're a college athlete and you sign a letter of intent, you're saying when you sign that letter, I'm going to agree to the, to the, the policies that that school has to agree to to be a member of the NCAA. So then you get there and you say, no, I'm going to sue you now. You said you agreed to that. Nobody made you do it. Nobody says you got to take this job, but by the way, you can't get any NIL money. They're not saying stuff like that to you. They're, you, you agree to this. And I don't think that the one rule that they're challenging, that the NCAA is starting to enforce, is really an infringement on their right to make NIL money. Because what the NCAA is saying with this one basic rule is you can make all the NIL money you want. You just can't accept it as a part of the recruiting process. And they're not really doing this to the athletes. They're doing it to stop schools from buying players. Yeah, yeah. So you, you've got the top high school quarterback in the country. You want that player. You go to him, and, and instead of saying, hey, we'll give you $10 million as opposed to these idiots over here only giving you six. Mm -hmm. Instead of that, what you theoretically have to do is say, hey, we got the best coaches. Well, this coach, Manny, has a history of developing quarterbacks. We get guys into the NBA or the NFL or whatever it is. We can do this for you. And yes, by the way, when you get here, you'll have plenty of NIL yeah. opportunities. But you're not throwing money at them. That's how it should be. And the be. schools that are being, have been targeted by the NCAA, they have evidence that they actually did that. They offered them money in the recruiting process. So we're going to find out if that's if, if, the, if the courts decide, yeah, you can't stop schools from offering whatever they want. I hope they don't, but there are other remedies. If that happens, then you're going to see other things because this will eventually be solved one way or another. If it won't be solved through the NCAA, it will be solved in another way. Yeah, absolutely, and we'll see what happens with that. I'm, I, I'm interested to know what they rule in that case. GA Ready Hog says, can someone please post the members of the Hog men's golf team? Okay, Mike, can we post the members of the Hog men's golf team? Yeah, the, we always answer the questions, right? This is bizarre, but I'm, 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 I'm all into it. So okay, let's right. show it. Let's start off. And you're going to have to help me with some of these names. I'll try. I'll try. Say, the, what's the first name here? Christian Chris Castillo. Is it Christian? It looks like Cristiano. No, it's Christian. Christian Castillo. Yeah, okay. that's Okay. My, yeah. my script has a misprint on it. Oh, Christian okay. Christian Castillo. He's a senior from, originally from California, transferred in last year from High Point University. Have you ever heard of High Point? Nope, never. I haven't. <laughs> Played in 10 events last year, but he was an alternate in the postseason matches, like SEC tournament, regionals, and all that stuff. He has two years of eligibility left. Thomas Curry is a true freshman. He's an Arkansas kid with four years left. He's from Texarkana, Arkansas, but played at Texarkana, Texas High, and he won the 5'8 state championship with scores of 66 and 69. Love it. Now John Daly the second is a redshirt sophomore with three years to play, and he redshirted last year. And we all know who little John Daly yeah, is. Yeah, he, he doesn't need an explanation, yeah, does he? <laughs> yeah, we, we, and he probably is going to play more this year. John Driscoll III is a grad senior. This will be his last year. He transferred in from Northwestern. He had a really good fall last mm -hmm. year and was very promising but got injured. So it will be interesting to see what he does this year. Kalen Delaney yeah, yeah. is a redshirt freshman with four years left. He redshirted last year, obviously. 2021, he was named the top high school golfer in the state of Texas. Nice. So that's okay. a good freshman to look at. Love that. Matthew Griggs is a true sophomore with three years of eligibility left. He's another Texas golfer. He made the starting lineup in two events last year. Rex Hargrove is a two, true freshman from Houston. He was number 36 in the American Junior Golf Association rankings in 2022. Okay. Can you pronounce this last name? <laughs> I think he it's is on from the next, France. He is from France. He is from um, France. But I think it's on the next graphic here, and it's Mathis Leferve. Leferve. Okay. I he's, think that's how I would say it. If I was okay, he's a JUCO transfer. It's a fourth-year junior. He was named the National JUCO Player of the Year last nice. year. Nice. Okay, Manuel Lozada, yeah. fourth-year junior. He's from Argentina. Played in every 
uh, turn, Arkansas tournament last year was 16 rounds of par or better. So Ooh. that's a good player yeah. coming back. Okay, Jacob what? Skov Olsen? Oh, Skov Skov Olsen. Olsen. Yeah. Fifth year senior that. from Denmark, transferred to Arkansas from TCU, where he played in 11 tournaments and had two top 10 finishes. Okay, then we got true freshman Eric Plinge. Is that right? Plinge. Yeah, yeah. I would. From I Peru. think you're doing great. He played in seven pro events as an amateur there. And had six top ten finishes. So he's a promising young golfer. And then Matteo Pluccini. Pluccini. He, he's the only one of these guys that they actually provided a pronunciation guide. <laughs> so well, because it's we an know Italian he's Pluccini because they gave the phonetic spe- uh, pronunciation of that. He's a grad assistant senior who transferred in from Oklahoma City University where he was a three-time uh, Division Two All American. So that's ah, your golf line. There you go. Do you know what Pulcini means in Italian? I uh, don't. Okay, it means chicks, like baby chickens. Okay. You know, chicks. So there you go. Um, that was great, Mike. Also, if you're ever wondering about any of the rosters, just to help out G A Ready Hog. They are all found on the Arkansas Razorbacks website, which is ArkansasRazorbacks.com. There's a little drop-down menu. It says Sports. Go down. You can click your sport, and you'll see the roster on there. So in case you want to look up any of the rosters, uh, Dr. Strange Pork wants to know, and look, our lights changed, Mike. We now have purple lights on. Uh, Dr. Strange Pork wants to know about the Razorbacks in Major League Baseball who train here in the offseason. Do they have their own coaches slash trainers, or does the baseball staff fill those roles? How much interaction is allowed or legal to have between the pros and the college players? Okay, my expert over there says that the Major League players that are back here in the offseason generally work out on their own or sometimes together. They don't generally bring personal coaches or trainers here with them. Uh, they, They mostly help each other. Arkansas coaches can work with them. There's nothing to stop them, but they say it's not real common. They got their own jobs to do, and, and they're busy, but they, they're not saying they don't ever do it. Um, the players' interaction with the major leaguers, they don't work out at the same time. The major league guys come in in the mornings when the current Razorbacks are in class, and then they're gone in the afternoon when the players come in, and the current players after they're out of class. So there's not a lot of interaction in terms of training with the, I'm sure they see each other from time to time. Yeah, I'm sure they do. But there's nothing to stop any of this from happening. There are no NCAA rules or whatever. It's just that they generally travel in different circles. Well, they can train in the off season together, right? Because I've I've seen them train in the off season together, so. But they just don't generally do it. Right, right, and not in general. Not when school is in in progress because they've got classes to go to and the players Again, the major leaguers come in in the morning. Absolutely. And our final question of the day, and I love this one, so thank you, WV Hog fan, for asking. Dre Greenlaw's story is a true rag-to-riches story. Michael Orr and the Tuies in the blind side was a touching story as well, but it was somewhat scripted from the beginning. Is there a documentary or a movie planned to tell Dre's life story? Uh, we don't think so. And it is a very <laughs> similar story in basis. You have a young man who was... I wouldn't say he was homeless, but he was in and out of homes and at times he was in shelters and all of that. And then a high school coach, a coach at Fayetteville High took him in. He then went on to become a really good player at Fayetteville High, a really good player at Arkansas, and now he's a good player and isn't going to be playing in the Super Bowl. As far as making a movie about that, I'm not sure that's always helpful. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at that movie, The Blind Side. Okay, Sandra Bullock won an Academy Award for it. She did, yes. It was a popular movie. You liked it. I did, I did you enjoy really it. really liked the movie. I loved the movie. I thought it was one of the stupidest <laughs> movies I've ever seen. I because did. I know football I and I know it. how idiotic that was. You don't have, what was her name supposed to be? Tui, Leanne yeah, Tui. Yeah, Leanne Tui, yeah. Leanne Tui is sitting in the stands, Sandra Bullock, watching her son play football, her adoptive son, and he's not doing very well. And she calls Hugh Freeze, who was his actual real coach, yes. uh, Michael Orr's real coach at this school, high school, was, was, uh, was and, and you don't call Hugh Freeze up on his cell phone and he answers the cell yeah, phone and has Hollywood. a conversation with you while the game's going on. That was Hollywood, Hollywood. There was a scene in there where she makes him mad and he gets mad at this smart aleck guy who's been making fun of him, and he blocks this guy 50 yards all the way down to the end of the field and dumps him over the edge. 
I've Hollywood. never seen a guy dumb enough in my life on defense to being, if he's being blocked, to sit there and backpedal with his feet. At some point, you let you just let go of your legs and you go to the ground, and he can't continue to do that. So they made this dramatic effect. He took this guy all the way to the end of the football field and dumped him over the edge yeah, to make Hollywood. a point. It's stupid. <laughs> I mean, you heard of suspending your disbelief, Mike? The point is, this movie was kind of idiotic. And it made Michael Orr mad. Mm -hmm. He got mad because he said it made him look like he didn't know how to play football, and then the Tuohys taught him how to play football. And he said, I knew how to play football all along. But then when this movie became a big hit, and they made a lot of money off of it, he found out he apparently wanted to collect money that he never, they say he never cared about it while he was in the NFL, but once he was out, he started asking, Hey, where's my money from this movie? Because yeah. they made a lot of movie. He money. didn't get hardly any money from the movie. didn't, apparently. And they said, well, wait a minute. You weren't really adopted. We had a conservator. You were a con we were conservators. Yeah, which conservatorship, is a, yeah. Which is a little bit different from adopting somebody. And then he said to them, you just did this to railroad me and, and to go right by me. And he said, they claim, he said to them, if you don't pay me $15 million, I'm going to reveal this to the public and make you look stupid. He says he never did that, but he says he wants his money, and they're fighting over this. So if you had this really cool situation where these people took this kid in that had nowhere to go, and they did, they gave, got him, because his biggest problem was staying eligible in high school, and they got him a tutor, and his grades got better, and he was able from that to get a scholarship. But then it evolves into some others. Hugh Freeze got a job at Ole Miss. And then Ole Miss was under investigation because of it. So all this stuff, because you make a movie, it turns into all this crazy stuff. And so I think Dre Greenlaw would be better off if no one made a movie <laughs> about any of this. And he, what I hope he does yeah. is do what he's done in some of these other games, get a couple of big interceptions in the Super Bowl, and then when his free agency time comes, he can just make a potload of money on his own. He go. doesn't have to worry about somebody that wrote a book or made a movie about it. That's true, but if there was somebody that wanted to make a movie out of Drake Greenlaw's life, I think he, w I think he would welcome it. I think he would be excited. Yeah, I'm to just saying it might not be a good thing. It may not be a good thing, but I'd like to see the movie Money of Drake has Greenlaw's a way of, of messing things up. It does, but... I keep thinking, now I'm down on this uh, this rabbit hole of thinking, who would play? Who's the actor that would play Dre Greenlaw? Mm. Like a Michael B. Jordan? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. You, you claim you ran into some Tui relatives. I did, at Disney World one time. Yeah, they yeah. didn't like the Tuis at all. They didn't like the real Tuis. No. And then we had one nice. of the Tuis, the, the little kid Tui. He was here under, uh, under uh, what's his name? The oh, yeah. Yeah, That's he was right. uh, under Chad Morris. He was his PR guy. That's right. He would... People told me, hey, that's the, that's the real little kid from the blind side. And he's standing over there in the corner, and we're having these press conferences. And, and so Morris would come out and go to the podium, and he'd be standing over there, and he had all these notes that he was looking at. And then you could see Morris would be up there, and he'd have all these things. But he'd put them down here, and he'd, yeah. he'd be looking down like, oh, what am I going to do? <laughs> and I'm thinking, I never, saw, I never covered a coach that had notes at a press conference. But apparently Tui had made these notes for him. And then, and then when they got ready to leave, uh, Morris would walk out, and, and you could see him go down the hall, and they were talking, well, you did this, but you should have done that. And this, you could have done a better And he was advising him on he how He, like, gave to, him a grade on the press conference. Yeah, he was advising him on how, how he did in the press conference. I'm thinking, tell that little Tui squirt to go back to the movie. We don't need him here. <laughs> go back to the movie. Go back and be that little kid in the movie. <laughs> go, eh, eh, you can drive me to school. Oh my gosh, Mike, that is probably one of the funniest things you've ever said on this show. But that's going to do it for this week's Ask Mike. We'll see you next Monday to answer more of your questions.